Welcome to View from the North on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about what the Canadians think about the election here in the United States. How do they feel about the United States now? Our guest for this show is Canadian retired businessman, Ken Rogers. Welcome to the show, Ken. Uh, hello, Jay. Uh, it's an interesting subject matter of great interest to Canadians. Well, yeah. So uh, your perception of it and the perception of the people around you, what do you think of the election? What do you think of what happened? Well, I thought an interesting way would to give you a few quotes from prominent Canadian newspapers. Okay, here's, here's one that I thought was a good starter. It was just a few days ago, Donald Trump claimed that the um, <clears throat> that the nation was the laughing stock in the eyes of the world he was right that was then uh, it certainly uh, is true now you know that's one way people have said it you know um another one was um you know just generally a description which um, many people might not call flattering, but it kind of gives a, a summary of uh, who Donald Trump really is, is, um, is nothing in the U.S. election really mattered. Probable dementia, the unfathomable ignorance, the emotional inconsistency, uh, the shambling, rambling, hate-filled campaign, or the laborious, unworkable anti-policies. The candidate out on, out on bail in four jurisdictions, the convicted fraud artist, the adjudicated rapist, the sexual pre predator, uh, the, hus the habitual bankrupt, the stooge of Vladimir Putin, the man who tried to overturn the last election and all of his creepy and crooked friends, ideologues and lunatics, Americans took a long look at all of this and said, yes, please. Where's that from? That's probably from the most important newspaper in Canada, the uh, you know, Globe and Mail. Mm. It's published in Toronto, but it's a national paper that... Uh, is uh, probably the most important business paper in Canada. And, you know, we don't, much like the U.S., you don't have too many newspapers left, and those that are left are pretty important. Uh, you know, but this is the um, more than the Wall Street Journal equivalent in Canada, you know, because it's the only one. There's, uh, you know, similar additional quotes, but, uh, but to a great extent, uh, Canadians were praying for, hoping for, and based on on what they'd seen in terms of polling, that uh, that Kamala Harris was going to win, um, and uh, you know, so it was a bit of a surprise and a shock, uh, and uh, you know, everybody's not too sure what's going to happen. You know, which of the many Trump promises is he going to keep? Um, you know, for example, uh, one of them was it would have an immediate 10% uh, tariff, at least 10% tariff on everything whatsoever. Well, about 75% of Canada's exports go to the U.S. You know, in terms of the world scale, Canada's a fairly large trading country, you know, but but exports and imports are a huge percentage of our gross uh, domestic product or GDP, uh, as opposed to the U.S. is is probably close to the smallest in the world in terms of what portion of their economy is made up of from international trade. Uh, so that um, you know, if you immediately put a 10% tariff on everything, you're going to have a, an instant mess um, in Canada. Um, now, all of those people in the U.S. that are used to buying those 
Canadian goods, you know, you're simply increasing the price of it 10%. Well, what'll happen over time, uh, you know, now I'll take just my opinion, you know, as a, uh, let's say I took tons of economics at university. I have a PhD in in economics from a a, a very high-ranked U.S. school. So my economic thinking is very American slanted, let's call it. Um, and and really the best example of what um, would probably happen in many instances for Canada is that the softwood lumber mess is the would be the precedent or the example. You know, for years and years and years, um, the United States has put always a a tariff on softwood imports from Canada. And every time it goes before the um, resolution tribunal, Canada wins. You wait one week later and the U.S. slaps the same kind of thing back on because you've got, you know, lumber, pulp and paper producers, particularly in the southeast of the U.S. that that have enough clout and pressure that that the U.S. government doesn't care what the rules are. They just put it on anyhow. Well, that's been going on for 10 or 15 years. Well, all of the huge uh, pulp paper and lumber companies in Canada have all gradually acquired huge positions in the United States so that they're, they're, the companies themselves are a little more immune from it. You know, they produce, but really what you've had was that the net result was a job shift from Canada to the U.S. because of that tariff policy. Um, you know, and I tend to think that's what Trump's strategy is, is basically, you know, why import something from Holland or Germany? Uh, uh, we should have that job in the United States, you know, and buy something produced locally. Um, you know, and and if you take a general idea of protectionist trade policy, you know, there are few countries in the world that would be, you know, as immune from the adverse effects of that as the United States, you know, because you have the the smallest portion of your economy relies on exports. Um, and another factor where one might say it's not such a bad idea for the United States uh, is that the United States is always running a huge uh, international trade deficit. Now, much of that relates to the fact that the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency in the world, and it's always overpriced. Well, if the U.S. dollar is overpriced, then that hurts U.S. exports, and it and it uh, encourages the U.S. to import things. Anyhow, the overriding thing, I think, is it's pretty negative for the world that if you slap tariffs on and you disrupt all of world trade, um, you know, there's not just which or who are the winners and who are the losers. That That isn't the, the case. The economic theory is very clear that, um, that the freer the trade is, the better it is for everybody. And what about this notion of uh, increasing tariffs, not only to Canada, but everywhere? Um, and uh, like 20% in some places, maybe across the board, and dropping the income tax. Your thoughts about that? If you have a tariff on goods, uh, let's, let's just use, for example, if you had a, a tariff of 10% on steel that's imported into the United States, the Canadian or German company that's selling the steel um if it still goes to the US you know the because the US buyer of it is now paying 10% more for that steel well the US buyer puts up the money like the, he pays the extra 10% but it's the US government that gets that 10 10% so that's like a you know you could say in lieu of collecting income tax, that 10% would 
fund some of the government expenditures. Um, and and I think Trump thinks that's a good idea. Um, so it's just very very unconventional and um, you know and and it doesn't really work well in the long run. Uh, you know, because you're really not going to keep paying the premium price for stuff. You know, you switch so that if that, as I used in the example of the softwood lumber, if you suddenly change and you produce the pulp and paper in the U.S. instead of producing, you know, cutting the tree down in Canada and creating the paper uh, out of it and then sending the paper to the United States, if you're doing that, the job in the United States, you you no longer collect the tariff from anybody. You know, so it's a, it's a very short-term kind of measure, but of course, American politics tends to be more short-term than, than anybody else in the world. Or maybe not everybody, but, but certainly, um, you know, it, 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 Americans seem to vote differently than the rest of the world. So if I have tariffs, and I knock off the income tax, the tariff becomes a, a kind of sales tax because everybody has to pay that. But there's nothing uh, uh, there's nothing refined about it. Uh, and, and the result is that there's no graduated income tax. We all pay the same. And that, to me, that sounds like it's completely regressive. And regressive taxes, uh, you know, are a disadvantage for the lower end of the scale, for the middle class and and below, um, and they are a benefit for uh, the upper end of the scale, the wealthy. Your thoughts? Yeah, when you when you take economic courses in taxation, um, in which I took, uh, you know, several of them at uh, New York University when when I was doing masters and doctorate program, and and the theory is pretty straightforward that um, that a sales tax is very regressive and an income tax is progressive by progressive i mean the guy with the biggest income pays the biggest amount of of tax as a percentage of their income you know the highest tax rate for somebody making a million dollars a year might be 60 percent whereas a person that's uh, making very little doesn't pay any tax at all, and and the guy at the lowest tax bracket pays less. Uh, where a sales tax, it's the same tax no matter what. Now the guy with the most money spends the most, so in total dollars they may pay the same you know the tax at the same rate as the poor guy, you know. But the guy at the bottom of the bucket that that currently is exempt from tax because their income is so low, they would still be paying that sales tax on everything they're buying. You know, if the sales tax applies to everything. Now, on imports, uh, you know, if you're a Canadian, you know, one of the important things we import is food. You know, so so the guy at the bottom of the bucket in terms of income, would still be sucking air on a sales tax. Now, in the United States, uh, you know, that would apply to somebody that lives in Montana or or Minnesota or, you know, uh, North Dakota, you know, Maine, New Hampshire, you know, a bunch of those northern states more so than some southern state. But nevertheless, it's still the same idea. It's just less magnified. Well, given some of the uh, you know the policy points and promises that Trump has made, it sounds to me like um, these things could easily result in a recession or depression in this country. And I, I would add that uh, I think that the U.S. and Canada, uh, from an economic point of view, have been joined at the hip for a long time. So if this country had a recession or depression during the, the coming Trump term, how would that affect the Canadian economy? The saying is, if the U.S. sneezes, the Canada catches a cold. If the U.S. catches a cold, Canada gets pneumonia. Um, so, so it really is magnified. And and if you take, just throw in those um, 
if you put a universal tariff, 10% across the board on everything that Canada currently exports to the United States, plus, you know, the U.S. having uh, a recession, that would be pretty catastrophic for Canada. However, um, you know, I think that one of the important things about it is not so much that the tariffs would lead to a recession per se as much as they would regenerate the inflation you know is is a because if you simply simply stop and add 10% to the cost of everything the united states is importing the very next day everybody and every company is still going to consume the same stuff but whatever is being imported is simply at a price that is 10% higher. Now, that jar, you know, jar to inflation would be, even though the U.S. has imports or a smaller percentage of all of the consumption than most any country in the world, um, or certainly any advanced country, um, it still is enough of a jolt. I mean, you know, you think of inflation at 1% and it's, it's pretty dramatic. And you have an awful lot of the economy that has suffered badly because of high interest rates. You know, like my opinion after the fact, looking at, over at, the, at what caused the vote for Trump, um, you know, you really have the the idea that the Biden administration to an economist has done a wonderful job with the economy. You know, the United States economy is the envy of the world in the terms of how well it's performed. However, if you take the majority of the population and you remember that for the last 50 years, virtually all of the increase in uh, productivity or GDP per person has all gone to the upper uh, income bracket people. You know, the, you know, multimillionaires, uh, you know, and let's call it from the, you know, from the medical doctor higher, just the people that earn more than your, than a really good lawyer or really good medical doctor, anybody that earned less than that generally didn't get any share of the phenomenal increase in in economic output per person. So so what you really have is is the message that Trump kept saying, you know, are you worse off? You know, and most everybody would say yes. You know, where where the economist would say no, no, that's crazy. We've got, look at the whole economy has done well. We're the envy of the world. Really, uh, you know, the guy who got swacked in COVID and and has never recovered since. Like, COVID wasn't that long ago. It was in the Biden era. You know, and he was president while COVID, you know, was occurring, or at least the majority of the mess from it. You know, even though Trump suggested you drink bleach and that sort of stupidity. However, uh, you still had the basic idea to the guy on the street uh, is that uh, COVID is a not so long ago phenomenon. And, and that's sort of in the era when Biden was president that everybody suffered. Well, they, they've not recovered enough to make up for that. You know, everybody's still feeling pains of COVID or or the economic hit that they took during that era. Or if they didn't take it, you know, their brother-in-law did or their sister did or their kids did. You know, they say, you know, how how do you feel about the economy? And the answer is terrible <laughs> or mm. not good. It should be better. And mm. so, you know, that's where the, you know... Um, Division of the spoils, you know, has, has really, you know, been key in that thinking. However, you know, my opinion as a as a 
you know, in tra- being trained in economics is that most of Trump policies would simply exaggerate that, you know, the wealthy will get a bigger slice of the pie rather than a smaller slice of the pie under his policies. Canada is um, very diverse. Canada has handled its diversity well. It's famous for that. Um, uh, it has a social safety net. It's famous for that too, including medicine. Um, and it is a you know modern democratic country. Uh, free speech is uh, everywhere, um, and so forth. And you know what we found here in in this election was that a lot of people in the United States uh, really didn't care about those things. They don't like diversity. They don't like the social safety net or social security. Um, they don't, you know, particularly like caring for their neighbors. My question, and it's based in part on the fact that there was this um, this this strike. Remember the trucker strike a couple of years ago in Canada? Uh, you read and you said that people in Canada really were surprised by Trump's election. They don't particularly like Trump. Uh, they remember, you know, a lot of people have amnesia about what he was doing. They remember what he did, what he said over all the years. They favored Kamala Harris. But I'm wondering if there are people in, in Canada that um, like Trump. I wonder if the, the kind of thinking that we saw on Election Day uh, also has uh, some, um, you know, some traction in Canada. And there are people who would be infected, may I use that term, um, by what happened in this country and what what happened, you know, to elect Trump? Uh, the answer is yes, but not to the same scale as the U.S. Um, you know, I know of, of a couple of, you know, extremely intelligent, capable people who, you know, think Trump is wonderful and, and his general policies uh, are things that they favor, but they think... Uh, I believe in a fairly narrow lens of of they are in businesses where regulations or government stuff really disrupts their business, it creates continual uncertainty, and they are so anti-government involvement, sort of keep your bloody hands off kind of attitude, and that so dominates their thinking that nothing else counts you know if you if you really got them off of that subject and asked them about a bunch of other things they would think of you know the um you know trump policy of of separating kids from their parents and throwing the kids in in quasi jails is totally inhuman and and totally unacceptable and they wouldn't like, you know, the kind of, you know, that Trump could, you know, stand on a pulpit and just spew out tons and tons of lies. And almost everybody knows they're a blatant lie, but they don't care anyhow. You know, like that does not seem very Canadian. <laughs> um, now, again, in terms of your question about the changes in the political atmosphere in Canada compared to the U.S., we definitely have had a trend uh, toward being much more conservative. Now, our current prime minister, Justin Trudeau, is um, not as far to the left as Bernie Sanders, you know, but certainly, uh, you know, similar to Kamala Harris. People just dislike him not necessarily the policies. Um, you know, they're just tired of his government. He's been in government for a long time, and they just keep fluffing stuff. They're not doing much that's that's progressive. Now, on the party that's gained the most in popularity is, is the Canadian Conservative Party. I mean, that's what they call it. It's the Conservative Party. Um, now, they are not you know, it used to be called the progressive conservative policy, and they had a lot more progressive policies. Well, they kicked the word progressive out, much like the U.S. moving further and further to the right. Um, And so, you know, that party to the right 
if you had an election in Canada tomorrow, there is a fairly good chance they would get a majority. Uh, now, that might surprise an American, but in Canada, you have more than two parties. And so, you know, we have about five parties with seats in the legislature. And and so these, uh, you know, you need a coalition to form a government usually, you know, sometimes and and often in Canadian history, you either had the Liberal Party, which is the one Justin Trudeau is head of, or the Conservative Party. Uh, they have had majority governments quite often. Similarly, it's about oh, a third of the time, anyhow, maybe even half the time, they need some splinter party to work with them on a coalition. You know, in the current Canadian government, um, Justin Trudeau's party really only got about a third of the popular vote. Uh, and they needed, you know, but that translated into about 40% of the of the seats in the parliament. And then, so they had one of these splinter parties, uh, one that's even to the left of them, you know, that's in the Bernie Sanders league, you know, called the New Democratic Party. And, and the New Democrats and the Liberal Party have been the government of Canada for quite some time now. And if you have a new election in Canada, one may not turn out to be much different. Do you think the, um, the, the, the success of Donald Trump in this election a couple of days ago uh, has any effect on what you've been describing? Do you think it, it will encourage the conservatives? Um, do you think it will change yes. the calculus? <laughs> it, it definitely will. You know, they'll trade it as if it's a you know, shot of steroids. So I want to talk about uh, isolationism. This country, um, you know, has a tendency to go isolationist, uh, and um, Trump enhances that. Uh, he's made it part of his platform. He doesn't want to support NATO, doesn't want to support Western Europe. Um, and, and it sounds like he's going to give Ukraine up to uh, Vladimir Putin. So how, how do Canadians feel about that? How do they feel about isolationism? How do they feel about a new world in which the United States is isolationist and doesn't really care to get involved in anything outside its borders. Well, that would change the whole world. I mean, really, you know, the world order, as one would use those words today, kind of goes back to the end of World War II when, you know, the United States, by creating NATO and gradually expanding NATO, has you know, the main difference is you don't have European countries fighting each other. You know, where the whole basis of NATO requires kind of the the backing of the U.S. Like the U.S. adds that extra bit of military muscle that makes um, NATO makes more sense. Now, it was to a great extent designed to anti-Russia. Um, well, you know, if, you know, you say, um, you know, I guess, uh, Ukraine, you know, starts off as a mess. Well, probably Trump's immediate thing would to say, well, well, give the, uh, Eastern parts of, of the Ukraine that speak Russian anyhow, like the Donetsk reason region and, and the Crimea, you know, why don't we just have a peace and, Russia has those, and then Ukraine has the rest. You know, but next week the rest of you, Russia will just take the rest of Ukraine, and, and the three Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. You know, and Poland's next. Uh, you know, I suppose you get the little wee country called Moldova, if any, if Americans even know where that is. Um, you know, it's a teeny little country. You know, between. Uh, or let's call it on the west side of Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> however, I don't think that uh, uh, Canadians would be too happy with the demise of NATO. Uh, you know, like Canada has not really played a major military role anywhere. 
you know, we had used to have major peacekeeping uh, troops that we sent to places in Africa and so on, and most of those ended up as disasters and and caused a lot of political problems in Canada because it was like, you know, sending your troops down the sewer. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, Canada's... Uh, Share, military spending as a percentage of of GDP, it might be the lowest of all the NATO countries. Um, you know, and so you'd have sort of one of the, you know, Trump would really have, you know, if everybody's supposed to ante up to 2% of their gross domestic product, I think Canada's is barely over 1%. Um, now, if you doubled the military spending, you got to eliminate something else, you know. And and Canadians would, you know, riot to if you're going to take away their health care or something that requires that funding. One last question, Ken, and that is uh, more subjective. How do you feel? How do your friends and associates feel about what happened here? Are you, are you threatened by it? Are you dismayed over it? Um, what do you see into the future? Are you concerned about the future, not only for the U.S., but Canada and for the world? How do you feel about it? How intense are those feelings? I have fairly deep dismay. <laughs> um, now, I'm long enough in the tooth that that it does not affect my economic well-being the same way it would, you know, my children. Uh, you know, however, you know, I think that their life will be much harder uh, than it would otherwise need to have been. Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, particularly if, um, as many Canadians think, that, that it's one thing to say Trump has won and what are his policies, but many Canadians believe that um, four years from now, the Trump group will not give up power no matter what an election ha turns out to be. You know, they will have disrupted, between now and then, they will have completely gutted, uh, you know, a lot of the electro electoral mechanisms. Now, they got enough individual states with Republican majorities that, that even though some state like New York or California might might object and you might have state authorities objecting to it. Um, you know, the, the many Canadians think that um, that you have an absolute certainty that there's no way you'll ever get the Republican bunch out of power. You know, that's that's the real sad thing, and and that you're, uh, you know, you're really going to make it an oligarchy rather than a you know, it's like a dictatorship with a, all of the wealthy people, you know, getting a bigger share of the GNP than they already are, and everybody else is, uh, you know, sucking air. I mean, if you uh, demolish the federal civil service in the United States and you and you follow their, um, you know, Project um, 25. Uh, that, you know, you, yeah, you start saying, well, you're not going to have any public schools. You got to pay for your kids to go to school. Well, pretty soon you're going to have an awful lot of the population with no education at all. You know, and and you just, you know, you're not going to have anything resembling the, you know, the country that the United States is. It's a very sad feeling. I think that's more the thing is I I feel I. You know, lived in the United States for about eight years over time, much of which going to college. And I lived in Utah, where I really thought it was a wonderful place and the people were great. But, you know, I feel sorry for the for the young Americans, uh, you know, who are going to, you know, grow up in a quasi authoritarian dictatorship. <laughs> are they coming to Canada? Will they come to Canada? Uh well, I don't know about that. Um, most people, it's, it it won't happen overnight. 
you know, a lot of the effect. That, and so people will, you know, what's happened in, in countries where authoritarians have taken over is the public's kind of gradually taken in by it, you know, even in extreme cases. I would expect to be a fair and a number of Americans would want to get out of the United States, but where can you go where you would have a nice, free, good economic opportunity? Uh, you know, you got Canada and Europe and Australia, New Zealand, and, you know, where else? I think, you know, even if you have an, an inflow of Americans uh, into Canada, you, you know, you're still going to suffer in Canada. You know, if you add high quality immigration, you should be enhancing your economy. Well, I think one of the first things that, it, you know, Trump will do, you know, affecting Canada is say we, it, Canada should allow less imports of people, less immigration. Let's, uh, let's leave it there. Thank you, <laughs> On a sad Thank note. You very much, Ken. It's a sad note. Um, you haven't made me feel better, but I feel better about Canada. Uh, in any event, thank you very much, Dr. Ken Rogers, for sharing these thoughts and giving us perspective here in a week that will be historically memorable. Even if it's a sad perspective, uh, you know, all I can say is I wish you luck. <laughs> you know, and pray for the United States. They need it. <laughs> thank you, Ken.